this morning, so you can open. We'll start in Matthew 14, and if you want to mark our other basic text, we're going to use John chapter 6. There are uh, a couple of parallel accounts to this. We're going to pretty much go from one to the other. Matthew 14 and John chapter 6. We are in week number 21. Hard to believe, 21 weeks 21 Sundays gone in 2010. We are in week 21 of our study of the life and times of Jesus the Christ. And we're going to get into Matthew, the 14th chapter, in just a few moments. Before we do, if you'll bow, let's start off our day together with a word of prayer. Our great and awesome Father who is in heaven... We want to give all honor and praise and glory and reverence to you and and your name this morning. We are unworthy of coming before you, but we come boldly and confidently this morning as sons and daughters, granted entrance to your throne by the blood of your Son. And we are in awe of that great sacrifice this morning. And we rejoice this morning at His resurrection from the dead that gives us hope and purpose in this life. Father, help us to center our minds on what is most important in this life. It is so easy to become so distracted and to chase things in this life that don't really matter. Help us on this first day of a new week to anchor our hope and our joy and our priorities in You. And help us to use this day to sharpen our focus and and strengthen our resolve to let our lights shine brightly for Your glory this week. We pray that you would be with us as we open up your word. Help us to have open and receptive hearts and to study our Lord and Savior this morning. Study how he acted and and how he interacted with people and how he dealt with the ups and downs of life. Help us to study intently his example so that we might live also as you have always envisioned. Please be with us throughout the day as we seek to encourage each other and glorify your name. And it is through Jesus and his sacrifice that we pray this morning. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 14 is where we are. If you've got your packets, you can open them. If you don't have one of these, it's not a a big deal. We're just going to make a brief note in those. But our our, our timeline packets, if you've got those, you can flip back to week number one of this study and just peruse over the course of the first several pages. Unless I have missed something, this is the first miracle uh, that we're studying this morning. First miracle that is documented by all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There have been a lot of miracles. Uh, I, I have been highlighting as, as we move along to make them stand out in, in my own list. It started back in John 2 with the first miracle at the wedding in Cana. There was the healing of, of an official son. There was a man with an unclean spirit healed in a synagogue. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. Many were healed that evening outside of her house. There was the miraculous catch of fish. There was the healing of a leper, of a paralytic, of an invalid man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. A withered man's, uh, a withered hand uh, on a man was healed on the Sabbath. Jesus again healed a great multitude. There was a centurion servant. There was the son of a widow raised from the dead. A demon-oppressed man. Uh, the calming of the stormy sea. Casting out demons uh, out, out of a violent man. An ill woman healed by touching Jesus' garment. Jairus' daughter brought back to life. Two blind men. A demon-oppressed man. All that we have read about. That's a lot of miracles. 
and it's easy to kind of forget just how many we have run across. And yet, out of all of those miracles, this one that we study this morning, beginning in Matthew 14, right around verse 15, is the first one that all four Gospel writers document. Matthew 14 and the 13th verse of the chapter begins Matthew's paragraph. When Jesus had heard this, and of course we studied about what He heard last week, about the the murder, the, the brutal death of John the Baptist. Matthew 14 and verse 13, When Jesus heard this, He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by Himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed Him on foot from the towns. When He went ashore, He saw a great crowd. We're up here on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He had compassion on them and healed their sick. And the scene beginning in verse 15 is up here on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. There is a large open area perfectly suited for a very large crowd. And that's what we're reading about in verse 15. When it was evening, the disciples came to Him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages, like Capernaum, like Genesaret that you see on this mount. There are other villages in the general area. Send them over to the villages and buy, uh, uh, send them away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Keep your hand there or your marker there in Matthew chapter 14. Turn over with me to the Gospel of John chapter 6 that gives us a little more of the dialogue here of Jesus with the, uh, the, these closest of followers. John chapter 6, and look at verse 5. John 6, verse 5. Lifting up his eyes then, seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, John tells us he looked at Philip and asked the question, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what He would do. There has been a certain amount of training and teaching that has gone on. And so we're just going to toss this out here and, and see just how far Philip has progressed in his understanding and, and his faith. Philip, in the latter part of verse 5, or, or uh, the, yeah, the latter, or verse 6, or verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii. You take 200 days worth of wages. A denarii, especially in Galilee, was basically what a person would get for one day's worth of wages. And so if we had 200 days worth of wages, more than a year and a half, if you work every day, that wouldn't be enough bread for each of them to get a little. How many people are gathered here on, on this sloping plain? <laughs> 5,000 men plus women and children. And so we're talking about an enormous, enormous crowd of people. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Just a little further north up this slope, there's an a, a ancient chapel that has a, a mosaic of five loaves and two fish and supposedly even the rock that Jesus sat on when, when He distributed these things. Of course, all just local legend. But what we've got is five barley loaves, two fish, and, and, and we've got those, but what are they for so many people? Jesus answered, have the people sit down. And so you picture these thousands and thousands, maybe 10, 
12, 15,000 people that sit down on this sloping plain, much grass in the place, John tells us. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when He had given thanks, He distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted, And when they had eaten their fill, when 5,000 plus have eaten all that they want to eat and they're full, He told His disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. There are leftovers. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that He had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Maybe a couple of different lessons that we can draw out of this. What stands out to you from these couple of paragraphs from Matthew and John that we have read? Any important lessons to draw out of that before we move on? Dave, go ahead. Again, kind of going going back to the the purpose, I mean, the ultimate conclusion was that, you know, this is the prophet. Okay. Uh, But he was more than the prophet. Yeah. Uh, But they were referring back to perhaps, uh, you know, Moses' prophecy. Yeah, back in Deuteronomy. Yeah, uh, the prophet, and, and so they knew they were aware of this, and you know who could do such things? I mean, you know, make enough food out of this little bit of uh, you know uh, enough for a few people, you know, for five thousand, almost twelve, fifteen thousand people. That's that's hard to imagine. Yeah, and you know he has that kind of power. You know, you know what kind of man is this? You know that that was the whole purpose of it was to prove or demonstrate. He was It definitely gets the people's attention and they're very excited by what they have seen, no doubt about it. And and there are some who are thinking back to Moses' words just before he dies in Deuteronomy saying that God's going to raise up a prophet like me from among you and you need to listen to him. And so not only is this a great rabbi, not only is he a miracle worker, but there are those who say, well... Maybe this is the fulfillment of what we've been studying now for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Not yet the Son of God, right? But a great prophet. Go ahead. I was about to say, it shows me a lot about faith. Okay. You know how people, they thought that, you know, it was like there's five loaves of bread here and two fish. I mean, how can this possibly feed all these people? But they did what Jesus said. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. They had 12 basketfuls of stuff left. So it's like, you know, like God, God can do things that sometimes we we don't can't even imagine. Yeah. You know, how it's gonna happen. You know, but it <clears throat> even those men who have been walking with him wherever he goes, uh, they've heard a lot, but they can't possibly wrap their minds around Jesus taking this little amount of food and doing that. Now, in hindsight, it's easy for us to look back and say, well, they certainly should have. They've seen two people now raised from the dead. And if Jesus could raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, and He could raise that son of the widow, that procession that's going through the city of Nain, well, then He certainly could do this. Odds are... I would have reacted the same way that Philip and and you would have reacted the same way as Andrew. Slow of heart to believe, right? Uh, But when Jesus does provide some direction, we've got every indication that they start and they're taking a little bit of a gamble, right? I mean, you start and you've got uh, five loaves and two fish. First of all, you're going to divide that between 12 people. And then you're going to start handing that out and maybe you get to three or four people and you're out of food and you look rather foolish, right? And so they do step out in faith and they do begin 
uh, performing what Jesus tells them, and, and it works out, and uh, abundantly so, Alan and, and then David. Jason, you, you mentioned that uh, all four gospel writers wrote yeah. this. Well, this is something done. He's been, he's been raising people from the dead. He's been healed with the lame. Cast the demons out. Those are important. Well, why would all four gospel writers write about this? Yeah. All in here deals with something, substance for the stomach. Okay. Nothing to do with uh, spiritual. It has nothing to do with physical. And to see this happen, it's amazing. I mean, have so many baskets left over. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it, it impacts many, many thousands of people. It, it's not just one person who is raised from the dead. There are thousands who can go back through that region of Galilee and say, listen, I'm full and there isn't any logical explanation for this, but I've experienced something. And, and so perhaps that is why all, all four encompass uh, the, the details. We're going to note here in just a little while some of the things, particularly in the Gospel of John, this gives Jesus, like Dave mentioned, a profound opportunity to make a great spiritual point. A very important spiritual point, okay? That we're going to come back to. But this is a very tangible, physical miracle that gets the attention of thousands of people. No, no doubt about it. David? Well, you just said it. I was going to say, you know, it involved everyone. So, yeah. You know, that's, I think it's the first time, if I'm not saying that, you know, everyone was involved in this. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there have been individual healings. There have been individual resurrections. But this is a large-scale miracle First one recorded by all four. Casey, go ahead. It's also uh, interesting, and not that he's not that he's expected to do something, but their preconceived notions about what he would do. Yeah. Especially at the end when it wraps up and he perceived that they were going to make him be king. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of times we have our own preconceived notions about how God's going to work in our lives. And he's going to do this for me. He's going to do this for me. Yeah. But that may not be exactly how he's going to do that. Sure. Sure. And I'm glad you centered there on the end because we really haven't focused on the end. And maybe that's where some of the greatest spiritual lessons in, in this little section come. Why do the people suddenly determine, well, we want him to be king? Why is that? What'd you say? Somebody said something over here. He made them full, they've got food. And who wouldn't want to have a king who can take five loaves and two fish and feed 10,000 people? Now, let's turn that over in our minds a little. Is that a, a, a good desire or a not so good desire? Why is it that Jesus reacts the way that He does? In verse 15, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by, by himself. Eric and, and then Dave, go ahead. I believe, like, as far as their, like, the intention, the intended purpose that they had of making him king, it wasn't, like, necessarily a spiritual reason for him to be king. It was yeah. more like a, a kind of selfish reason to where they just want to be filled. They know that he can provide for them. Yeah. You know, do stuff for them, and they could probably have whatever they wanted. Like, yeah. They were thinking in their mind. This is not performed in the center of Jerusalem where the majority of the people have plenty to eat and a stone roof over their heads and the security of city walls and, and plenty of soldiers all around to protect them in case the Egyptians come along or something like that. This is in absolute desolate rural Galilee among a bunch of peasants and fishermen the tax collectors come in and take money and carry it back to Jerusalem these are poor people who live in houses made of baked mud for the most part and seriously have to work the ground for everything that they have to sustain their lives. Here's someone who comes along 
and miraculously provides, well, I'd much rather have him than Herod. You know, we talked about King Herod, who was tetrarch over Galilee and Perea last week, the one who killed John the Baptist. He's the king in this area. What has he done for me lately versus what this man is able to do? Perhaps has something to do with it. Dave, you had your hand raised. I was just going to make the contrast between the, if you will, the, the kind of the selfishness of people with their own uh, you know, needs, physical needs, yeah. to Jesus, complete opposite, uh, you know, void of uh, ambition to become a physical king. Yeah, and he was. I mean, he had the opportunity right here. He could have just, you know, let it happen, and he didn't. He he walked away from a, yet another opportunity. To be physical king. Yeah. That was not, that's not his ambition, that's not his purpose. And those two polar opposite ends of uh, the spectrum, you can kind of see it here. Yeah, absolutely. Right here in one paragraph. Yeah. He had the opportunity back in Matthew chapter 4 with the temptations of Satan. He's here on the pinnacle of the temple. Just throw yourself and it, it, it's a, a matter of prophecy in the Psalms. The angels won't allow you to dash your foot against the stone. Just do that and everyone in Jerusalem will follow you. But he doesn't do it. And here he's got the backing of thousands of people. And he walks away because this is not what his kingdom is all about. His hour, first of all, has not yet come. And when he utters that phrase frequently throughout the Gospels, what's he talking about? What is that hour that he is talking about? Ultimately, his death and his, his burial and his resurrection and, and, and eventually his glorification, but particularly his death, right? How ironic that he is going to be king through the avenue of crucifixion. Not this way. Everything is turned on its head by Jesus. Uh, every, all of those expectations are are completely shattered. Go ahead. So I can see next Sunday is uh, the bread of life. Yeah. Yeah, and we're, we're going to talk about that, uh, particularly even this morning in our, in our sermon. We're going to go back through and we're going to read some of Jesus' statements here after this miracle where the spiritual point is really driven home. But I think Eric put it well that you've got a lot of selfish ambition here on the part of the people they're amazed they can't explain it but they know they're full and they know they're not happy with the present king and so why not this one it's evident that god is with him maybe uh we'll be able to throw off these shackles of hardship and and, and indentured servitude and and maybe life will go better and hey if nothing else uh we'll have plenty to eat for the foreseeable future. John, go ahead. Well, even the Jewish leaders of the day, and even today, the Jewish religion suffers from the misconception that they're looking for a physical thing. Yeah. yeah. That, that certainly has been caught up in error and is, is raising Jesus to death. Yeah. Beyond that, a matter of conjecture, I'll bet that was good I bet it was good food. You're exactly right. Let's go back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14. But John, John, that, that's a good way of, of tying that particular section up. That um, uh, the larger point of the New Testament in relation to the king and his kingdom has, has been missed by a great great many people for sure and we'll continue to flesh that out as as we move along jesus according to john went away by himself look at uh, matthew chapter 14 verse 22 immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds and after he had dismissed the crowds he went up on the mountain by himself to pray we've noticed that now a couple of times, haven't we? He goes up on the mountain by himself to pray. 
When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land. John tells us they had rowed about three or four miles out into the sea, and there is a great storm that is going on. They're a long way from the land. They're beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. And here's a time reference for us. Jesus has gone up on the mountain by Himself to pray and in the fourth watch of the night. Romans divided up the night into four different sections. Four three-hour sections from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And so the fourth hour of the night is somewhere or the fourth watch of the night is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. is the absolute middle of the night. Fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Yet another miracle. And again, I mean, those of us who have grown up hearing about that, uh, yeah, he, he walked on the sea. We've read that dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Um, but allow that to sink in. You know, we haven't run across this before. We've run across a lot, but not this before. Here in the absolute middle of the night are the disciples. They're beaten by the waves. These are experienced fishermen, several of them. They have grown up. They live on top of and around this sea right that's their livelihood and here for hours and hours they've been beaten by these waves terrible storm and here comes jesus and he is walking on the waves and what is their reaction verse 26 they're terrified and they say it is a ghost now again you and i in hindsight we think well, who else would it be, right? Other than Jesus. Um, but these are men very much like you and I. It's not a ghost, despite their, their initial reaction. They cry out in fear. But immediately, verse 27, Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter speaks up, verse 28. And answers, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to seek, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Okay. What can we glean out of those couple of paragraphs. What stands out to you, Gordon? Well, one thing you can learn you know, when Peter's walking on, on the water there, of course, he began to look around and he saw things that scared him. Yeah. And the same thing happens to us today. We begin to look around and see all these things in the world and looking at it. They don't scare us, maybe, but they entice us. Right? Yeah, absolutely. We start sinking spiritually. Yeah. You know, it, it's a very deliberate description by Matthew. Because, I mean, you don't really see wind, do you? But you see the effects of wind. You see uh, the wind blowing through the trees and wind blowing uh, uh, across the sea and, and things like that. But he's very deliberate with those words. He saw the wind. And what we take out of that is... As long as he's fixated on Jesus, he's walking. He's walking on water. He's not the Son of God. But as long as his eyes are on Jesus and he's focused, he can do the impossible. 
But when he takes his eyes off of Jesus, he sees the wind and what begins going through his mind. I can't do this. This is terrifying. Look at all of the wind and all of the waves and, and, and this is impossible. And so he begins to sink when he takes his eyes off of Jesus. There, there's great spiritual parallels there for us in our own walk with Christ. Go ahead. I was actually about to say what you just said. <laughs> okay. It, it's just a whole bunch of spiritual parallels and just this one account where Jesus walks in water. I mean, when you think about the beginning of this whole story, like they're middle of the night, fourth hour, you know, fourth watch of the night, there's a huge storm and Jesus is just walking on the like he's calm. Mm -hmm. First of all, within this storm that that's going on around him, he's just walking towards the boat like, man, just gotta get here, you know, like and I know a lot of times like we when we go through stuff, like when we're in that spiritual storm, we forget, you know, God has it all under control. You know, it's like he's just walking along and everything's under control, and that's what's gonna happen, and then we go out and step on that leap of faith just fixated on Jesus. And, you know, we just let the natural get to us. I mean, at least that's what happened to me. That's what yeah. I mean out of the, uh, the whole account here is that, you know, once Peter saw all this stuff happening, God still was God. <laughs> you know, he still saved me, even though he doubted. You know, he's like, well, you were a little bit why did you doubt? Took him back up, gave him another chance. And, you know, it just, it happens like that. So, that's what I get out of this. Okay. okay. Good thoughts. Alan, go ahead. You, you, you said uh, he tested Philip. Now he's tested him. He, yeah. He uh, was okay. Except he, he really was here. We're the same way. Yeah. Uh, exactly the same way. You know, it, I find it remarkable that he picks Peter up and, and he says what he says. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Um, you know, I've never walked on water, and you haven't either. Peter does for a little while, and then he begins to sink, and, and Jesus talks about his little faith. Now, he, he doesn't do that to kick him while he's down, right? He does that to show him it's time to grow, right? It, it, it's time to continue trusting me even more and more and more you you've tasted and seen what is possible here but you took your eyes off of of the anchor and, and so you began to sink and and that betrays your little faith now if peter had little faith what about the 11 who didn't get out of the boat well their their faith in in one sense perhaps is even smaller right they stayed in the boat we it's easy to pick on peter but there were 11 other guys who didn't get out of the boat. But if anything, it definitely shows us we got to grow, right? We've got to progress from an initial confession that, yeah, he's the Son of God. I mean, Simon had, had confessed that when Jesus uh, caused that miraculous catch of fish, right? This is not the first time that we run across this confession. It's the third time, I, I believe, Philip, back in John chapter 1, uh, when, when Jesus knew certain things about him, said, truly, you are the Son of God. And, and so we've run across this a couple of times, but do they really believe it to the point of building their own existence on it? That's, that's what's still very much in flux here. And if Peter had little faith, most certainly at times we do. John, you had your hand raised and then a couple more if we've got time. Go ahead. Another way in which it's illustrated that Jesus and God have control over the very natural force. Everything. Yeah, yeah. The one who calmed the seas is, is in control of everything. He upholds the universe by the power of his word. He's going to call forth dead, inanimate matter to life one day. He, he's in control of of it all. Dave? Uh, he was the prophet, now he's the son of God. Yeah. We, we see that uh, contrast here. Yeah. And, and what, what's interesting is Jesus accepted their worship. 
Yeah. I mean, he didn't, he didn't reject it. He, he accepted the worship. He recognized who he truly was. Yeah, yeah. Remember who's Matthew, who Matthew is writing for. Matthew is writing to convince Jews that Jesus is who he says he is. And so in the span of just a short amount of time, we've got the, the miraculous feeding. This is the prophet to walking on the water and calming the sea and saying, you are the Son of God. And, and accurately and importantly, he accepts their worship. He, he's not like an angel who says, don't worship me, worship God. He welcomes that. And that's a key part of Matthew's argument as, as to the identity of Jesus. Thank you for being here. Lord willing, we'll just continue on and uh, uh, be prepared for next week. If you don't have material, we've got it up here. And I appreciate your interaction and attention this morning.